All right, I will be reading from a, an article from October 2012 from Smithsonian, uh, at smithsonian.com, I believe originally in Smithsonian Magazine, at smithsonianmag.com, by Henry Weincheck, called The Dark Side of Thomas Jefferson in the History and Archaeology section. With five simple words in the Declaration of Independence, Quote, all men are created equal. Thomas Jefferson undid Aristotle's ancient formula, which had governed human affairs until 1776. Quote, from the hour of their birth, some men are marked out for subjection, others for rule. In his original draft of the Declaration, in soaring, damning, fiery prose, Jefferson denounced the slave trade as an, quote, exorable commerce, this assemblage of horrors, unquote, and... Quote, a cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberties, end quote. As historian John Chester Miller put it, the inclusion of Jefferson's strictures on slavery in the slave trade would have committed the United States to the ab abolition of slavery. That was the way it was interpreted by some of those who read it at the time as well. Massachusetts freed its slaves on the strength of the Declaration of Independence, weaving Jefferson's language into the state constitution of 1780. The meaning of, quote, all men sounded equally clear and so disturbing to the authors of the constitution of six southern states that they amended Jefferson's wording to all freemen. They wrote in their founding documents, quote, are equal. The authors of, these state con of those state constitutions knew what Jefferson meant and could not accept it. The Continental Congress ultimately struck the passage because South Carolina and Georgia, crying out for more slaves, would not abide shutting down the market. Quote, one cannot question the genuineness of Jefferson's liberal dreams, writes historian David Breon Davis. He was one of the first statesmen in any part of the world to advocate concrete measures for restricting and eradicating Negro slavery. But in the, 19, in the 1790s, Davis continues, the most remarkable thing about Jefferson's stand on slavery is his immense silence. And later, Davis finds Jefferson's emancipation efforts, quote, virtually ceased. And it's worth, he's a typical American that he could talk a nice story, but... Hey, he knows where the coin is. Okay, somewhere in a short span of years during the 1780s and into the early 1790s, a transformation came over Jefferson. The very existence of slavery in the era of the American Revolution presents a paradox, and we have largely been content to leave it at that, since a paradox can offer a comforting state of moral suspended animation. That's right, don't have to make moral questions get answered. Jefferson animates the paradox, and by looking closely at Monticello, we can see the process by which he rationalized an abomination to the point where an absolute moral reversal was reached, and he made slavery fit into America's national enterprise. We could be forgiven if we interrogate Jefferson's post Jefferson posthumously about slavery. I should probably speak slower. It's a long article, though. It is not judging him by today's standards to do so, though I'm willing to judge him by my standards. Today's standards aren't near good enough. Today's standards, you still, it's okay. People today think it's okay to, you know, use robots to bomb people that aren't an imminent threat. Today's standards suck. But anyway, many people of his own time, taking Jefferson at his word and seeing him as the embodiment of the country's highest ideals, appealed to him. When he evaded and rationalized, his admi admirers were frustrated and mystified. It felt like praying to a stone. The Virginia abolitionist Moncure Conway, what? There were abolitionists? There were people that knew that slavery was wrong back then? They were nuts. They stood out of the crowd. They wore the wrong clothes. What were they thinking? Of course nobody took that seriously back then. Slavery was fine then, Moncure. Noting Jefferson's enduring reputation as a would-be emancipator, remarks scornfully, never did a man achieve more fame for what he did not do. I'm going to talk about carrying water. Okay. Thomas Jefferson's mansion stands atop his mountain like the platonic ideal of a house, a perfect creation existing in an ethereal realm, literally above the clouds. To reach Monticello, you must ascend what a visitor called this steep, savage hill. 
Through a thick forest and swirls of mist that recede at the summit, as if by command of the master of the mountain. If it had not been called Monticello, said one visitor, I would call it Olympus and Jove its occupant. The house that presents itself at the summit seems to contain some kind of secret wisdom encoded in its form. Seeing Monticello is like reading an old American revolutionary manifesto. The emotions still rise. This is the architecture of the new world brought forth by its guiding spirit. And that's true. It's a very interesting place I visited there. In designing the mansion, Jefferson followed a precept laid down two centuries earlier by Palladio. We must contrive a building in such a manner that the finest and most noble part of it be the most exposed to public view and the less agreeable disposed in by places and removed from sight as much as possible. The mansion, and, and he does a lot of that, there's secret corridors for the slaves doing all the work so you, they don't really come in contact with you as much as they would otherwise. The mansion sits atop a long tunnel through which slaves, unseen, hurried back and forth, carrying platters of food, fresh tableware, ice, beer, wine, linens, while above them 20, 30, or 40 guests sat listening to Jefferson's dinner table conversation. At one end of the tunnel lay the ice house, at the other end the kitchen, a hive of ceaseless activity where the enslaved cooks and their helpers produced one course after the other. During dinner, Jefferson would open a panel in the side of the fireplace, insert an empty wine bottle, and seconds later pull out a full bottle. It's a very interesting setup he has. We can imagine, it's also interesting how it requires a slave in the cellar to be at all useful. We can imagine that he would delay explaining how this magic took place until an astonished guest put the question to him. The panel concealed a narrow dumb waiter that descended to the basement. When Jefferson put an empty bottle in the compartment, a slave waiting in the basement pulled the dumb waiter down, removed the empty, inserted a fresh bottle, and sent it up to the master in a matter of seconds. Similarly, platters of hot food magically appeared on a revolving door fitted with shelves, and uh, the used plates disappeared from sight on the same contrivance. Guests could not see or hear any of the activity, nor the links between the visible world and the invisible that magically produced Jefferson's abundance, as if the people were just a human resource, a part of the house. And these are the, those are the privileged slaves. It was ugly. But it had to be done, had to be done. Otherwise, how are you going to have a nice dinner party? Who back then possibly could get along without slaves? Oh, except for most of the people. Except for the not the top 1%. Everybody but the top 1% managed to get along with it. How weird. Jefferson appeared every day at first light on Monticello's long terrace, walking alone with his thoughts. From his terrace, Jefferson looked out upon an industrious, well-organized enterprise of black coopers, smiths, nail makers, a brewer, cooks professionally trained in French cuisine, a glazier, painters, millers, and weavers. Black managers, slaves themselves, oversaw other slaves. A team of highly skilled artisans constructed Jefferson's coach. The household staff ran what was essentially a mid-sized hotel, where some 16 slaves waited upon the needs of a daily horde of guests. It was also like a whole village of its, of its own. Oh. The plantation was a small town in everything but name, not just because of its size, but in its complexity. Skilled artisans and house slaves occupied cabins on Mulberry Row, alongside hired white workers. A few slaves lived in rooms in the mansion's South Dependency Wing. Some slept where they worked. Most of Monticello's slaves lived in clusters of cabins scattered down the mountain on the outlying farms. In his lifetime, Jefferson owned more than 600 slaves. At any one point, about 100 slaves lived on the mountain. The highest slave population in 1817 was 140. Below the mansion, there stood John Hemming's cabinet making shop, called the Joinery, along with the dairy, a stable, a small textile factory, and a vast garden carved from the mountainside, the cluster of industries Jefferson launched to supply Monticello's household and bring in cash. To be independent for the comforts of life, Jefferson said, we must fabricate them ourselves. He was speaking of America's need to develop manufacturing, but he had learned that truth on the micro scale on his plantation, where he was making a little model society f kept going by slaves. And eventually bankrupt. Jefferson looked down from his terrace onto a community of slaves he knew very well, an extended family and a, net a network of related families that had been in his ownership for two three or four generations. Though there were several surnames among the slaves on the mountaintop, Fawcett, Hearn, Colbert, uh, Gillette, Brown, Hughes, they were all Hemingses by blood. 
descendants of the matriarch, Elizabeth Betty Hemings, or Hemings related by marriage. Right. So sometimes slaves were brought in and married to Hemingses, but it was one big extended family. A peculiar fact about his house servants was that we were all related to one another, as a former slave recalled many years later. Jefferson's grandson, Jeff Randolph, observed, Mr. J's mechanics and his entire household of servants consisted of one family connection and their wives. So, part two is coming.